On this episode of Star Trek Universe, man, a Starfleet Academy series has been announced. Plus, we've got a bunch of Metallus stuff, uh, talking about Picard and Cisco and Janeway. And, of course, we talk about your feedback. All right after these words from our mystery sponsors. Star Trek Universe, the podcast where you can listen on two lifelong friends do what they've been doing since they were little bitty. Talk about Star Trek. My name is Matthew Carroll. I'm David C. Robertson. Dave, how are you, buddy? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here, man. I'm, I'm just amped up for, for new Star Trek, and yeah. uh, I, I don't know. I'm just excited and yeah. excitable. I haven't really looked into the news. I know, I know. One, one of the big pieces of news is the, the new. Starfleet Academy show. Mm-hmm. It's been announced, but you you were you were telling me there's a lot of good news. So let's let's um, talk. Well, there's a lot of interesting news. Good news right. to talk about, not necessarily like yay, but okay. uh, the Starfleet Academy series. Uh, apparently, Alex Kurtzman is going to be a showrunner alongside Noga Landau, uh, creator of CW's Nancy Drew and Sci-Fi's The Magicians. And they mm. made the following joint announcement. Admission is now open to Starfleet Academy. Explore the galaxy. Captain your destiny. For the first time in over a century, our campus will be reopened to admit individuals, a minimum of 16 Earth years or species equivalent, who dream of exceeding their physical, mental, and spiritual limits, who value friendship, camaraderie, honor, and devotion to a cause greater than themselves. The coursework will be rigorous. The instructors among the brightest lights in their respective fields, and those accepted will live and study side by side with the most diverse population of students ever admitted. Today, we encourage all who share our dreams, goals, and values to join a new generation of visionary cadets as they take their first steps toward creating a bright future for us all. Apply today. So, I think the the big news in that is for the first time in over a century, because that sounds like where else could they be doing this but in 32nd century. Exactly, yeah. So, that's, I mean, that's definitely the big headline, is that it sounds like they are going to continue the 32nd century plot line. Mm -hmm. So... That sounds that sounds cool. I'm I'm definitely down for it. I, I I've I've expressed my uh, negative opinions about the 32nd mm. century, but I like these characters and I don't want to leave them behind. I just uh, I just I just think it muddies up the works when you're telling two different timelines at once. Yeah, but I'm I you know I'm down. I'm here. I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it. We'll have three different timelines. That's true. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Tani Newsom announced that she's going to be a part of the writers' room on Starfleet Academy. She she plays Mariner. Oh, neat! On really uh, neat. Lower Decks, yeah. Nancy Drew and the Magicians. I, I never watched those shows, but I've kind of seen them on. You know, I've seen mm -hmm. clips and things, and they seem kind of uh, uh, juvenile, I guess. Yeah. Which makes sense with uh, the fact that this is like the Academy. Um. But I guess I, I guess I hope this isn't too, uh, too much melodrama, and it's good. I just hope it's good for all ages and not just for teenagers. It could be a slog if it's too teeny bopper. My hope is that um, it won't feel like something from the CW. Yeah, obviously. Exactly. And one of the big reasons I always thought CW shows were shit is because they're always stretched out to. 22 to 23 episodes and they just have way too much filler. Um, True. But then a lot of the DC CW shows started getting cut down to like 13 episodes a season and they were still shit. So I was like, Oh, <laughs> well, I'm worried now. Yeah. Sometimes but. it's just the effort you put in. You know? <laughs> um, but yeah, man, uh, I'm, I'm down for this. I'm down to see where they take it. Yeah, for sure. What else we got? So we've got Terry Metalis uh, talking to the Inglorious Trexperts at GalaxyCon panel. How, he's talking about season three of Picard will end 
and how it sets up what he hopes will be a new spinoff series. He says, uh, Star Trek VI really does have a feeling of finality to it. You do feel like that at any moment these characters might die. So the stakes are quite high. And again, it does a lot right for James T. Kirk. At the end of Picard Season 3, it's narratively right in that it closes a lot of narrative loops. <clears throat> he does see Star Trek VI as a model for Season 3. And they asked him if it would end with the cast signatures like Undiscovered Country did. And he says, no, because of Avengers Endgame. Kevin Feige is one of the biggest Star Trek fans out there, and he did it brilliantly in Avengers Endgame. And I mm-hmm, felt mm-hmm. like I can't do it. But, <laughs> yeah. but I think we do something quite nice, I will say. I think you will feel good. I Because that, in Endgame, that was something that I thought of. I was like, it's yeah. like Star Trek Six. <laughs> well, and you know, in, in, the other thing about Endgame is uh, when, they, when they were talking about making it, the writers talked about how it was inspired partially by all good things. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and so we were, we talked about it a ton when we were, um, you know, a a major time travel episode. And, uh, and then in the thing, they're going back and forth with these different timelines and stuff. And I, uh, or different parts of the timeline kind of touching on different eras and stuff. And it's just so clever, but it's very much straight out of the Star Trek playbook. And I, Mm -hmm. it's really great. Yep. So I'm I'm excited to see what they do. And um he does talk about how uh, Star Trek Legacy here at GalaxyCon, he says, I love this period in Star Trek, the twenty fifth century. I always view it as the present day in Star Trek for me. Mm. It's where we all left off, and the way we leave this season is a passing of the torch from the last generation to the next. I would certainly love the spin off to happen. We certainly leave it so you can do that. Awesome. He did uh, offer a little bit of specifics on the kinds of story characters and storylines that could be a part of it. He says, boy, wouldn't you want to check in with the Klingon Empire? Wouldn't you want to check in with Deep Space Nine and the Doctor from Voyager and everything that went on with the Bermanverse? So that's kind of where I see, I see is to explore the galaxy and sort of get back to the next gen roots of storytelling is what I would see as a kind of a version of Star Trek I'd like to see with this group of characters that we're seeing. I don't want to talk too much about them, although I think you could guess as to who I would like to see. And by the way, I think that includes a great deal of some of these legacy characters who I think have never been better. Jonathan Frakes being one of them. I mean, come on, guys. He's amazing. And also, mm-hmm. by the way, on Twitter, someone mentioned Alexander, Worf's son, and he was like, he would be on Star Trek Legacy, by the way. <laughs> oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, the moderator, Mark Altman, uh, had mentioned DS9 and uh, Nana Visitor, who says she was loving the new season. And Metallus said, she's so good. I mean, gosh, you want to see that. You want to see Nana so bad and what's going on with her and everyone. That would be phenomenal. Um, he says, <laughs> it's not up to him whether they get to make it. He says, I have no idea what you can do. I think be loud, I guess. I don't work for Star Trek right now. We are not developing anything. I know that Star, Star Trek came back to life because of the fans. They get to decide. So wh- however you best make noise is however you do it. Um and he did agree that the letter writing campaigns don't work now. Social media is where it's at these days, obviously. Yeah, he's put out the Star Trek Legacy hashtag and told everyone to use it and to, uh, you know, basically beg Paramount for this thing. And, yeah. Uh, I abs- and there's also a, um, a petition. And I'll put the link in the show notes. But it's already passed 15,000 votes. Um. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think I think it's a great idea. I, I <laughs> honestly, the idea of Warf Sun being uh, on the ship or like part of the mm-hmm. crew makes me nervous. I know it's called Star Trek Legacy. He didn't say he was going to be part of the crew, sure, or sure. part of the ship. He just said he was going to be on it. Right. Sure. Even so, him even being on the show, I don't know. Like it, it kind of feels like. Uh, if they do it too much, you know what I mean? Like, we've already got a Picard and a LaForge that they could easily put on the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, Two LaForges like and a Picard. Sure, sure, sure. It just seemed like a... The they've, other... still got, they've still got laws of memory engrams floating around. Yeah, Which it's true. is very telling that they have that. Yeah, you're right. I just, I don't want it to be... <sighs> I love Star Trek Next Generation. 
mm-hmm. but I don't need it again, and I don't need next generation babies. Like, I don't need it to just be ev- everyone to have their analog. You know what I mean? Like, I love, yeah. I love Voyager. It, it, I love the, I love the characters in Voyager, mm-hmm. and I like the mix of characters and how they're different from mm-hmm. the mix of characters on the other shows. And I like the, I like DS Nine for how different it is from Next Generation. And I don't want them to just like, all right, we got us a Picard, we got us a uh, LaForge, we got us a, a, a you know, Worf son. Um, I don't know. It, it, like at some point, it makes me nervous that they're gonna go too far with it. Yeah, I, I'm. I think there's a fine line, and I'm not yeah. sure. I uh, part of me thinks they already crossed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, like where it is now with like LaForge and Picard and and you know Crusher feels really natural. They've done a really good mm-hmm. job building those two characters up. And I know there's two LaForges, but it seems like. Um, the other daughter, the non Sydney daughter, is mm-hmm. more like uh, someone who's going to stay on. Uh, Aladria? Al- Alandria, I think. Alandria, okay. Uh, it seems like she's going to probably stay on the station with her dad or is working with her dad as an engineer. Although they, they could be the engineer and the pilot on the ship. Who knows? Yeah, if, which if it's the, even a ship. The other daughter that's with him is his actual real life daughter. And he right. was just on the view with her. And he said, if they do Star Trek Legacy, they're down for it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I just I, I I love the idea of like continuing these characters in some form. I just don't want them to be too cookie cutter about it and be like, well, let's continue let's continue this legacy in a very uh, literal way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I kind of just wish it was like, yeah, sure. These characters. I don't, I don't even know if they need. To, I'm always I love Star Trek, and I've always thought it'd be cool. You know, DS Nine is my favorite, partially because it breaks the format. It's not the crew on a ship. It's the crew mm-hmm. on a space station. And you, it, it creates all these different kinds of interactions with like, you know, having the same antagonists come back over and over. Cause you're not flying through space. You're staying in one place. Yeah. Um, and so I think there's, there's, there's space in Star Trek for something different like that. Like where instead of being a one, a crew on a ship, you could have these different characters and the way they're interacting with Starfleet, the way they're, fighting this changeling threat in different places. I've always loved that um, about the book series is a lot of times you'll have like three or four different storylines going on and they're just in different corners of the Federation. You know, I yeah. watched the, I watched a lot of the expanse um, love that show. And it does that where like, yeah, there's a crew, but there's also like this political stuff going on at earth. And there's this other stuff and sort of jumps around the, the solar system and tells all these different parts of the story. And then Mm. at some point it all kind of collides together in these beautiful ways. And I, and I've always loved that about the book series of star Trek. Um, I think the movies do that a little more, but like, it seems like on, on the, the tradition on star Trek is for the show to be on a ship all the time. And you're flying on a ship and you're doing a thing, mission, 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 and I just think there's room for different kinds of things like that. Yeah, I agree. What else you got? <laughs> long, <laughs> long dead air. That's what we got. Hey, yes, sir. Um, Terry Metalis talked a little bit about Kirk's body. There's been a lot of conjecture on the internet because there's apparently a, on that panel, it says something about uh, Project Phoenix on there. And there's mm. been a lot of hubbub about whether or not Kirk is actually dead. And, um... <laughs> well, my mind immediately goes to when a phoenix rises, it rises, like, back at full strength, you know? Uh-huh. Like, it's not, you know, it's not the elderly phoenix dying. It's like a rebirth. Right. So, if I was saying as a phoenix, you know, like, could be, like, a clone or some version of Kirk, like being born into the, you know, 25th century. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> That's where my mind goes for Phoenix. I mean, he wouldn't be allowed in Starfleet because you can't get more genetically modified than literally effing cloned. Well, I mean... Unless you're Picard and you're just a robot no, no. now. <laughs> well, that's not, that's not the thing. Like, ge- clones aren't genetically modified. They're genetic copies. Yeah. That's different. Yeah, maybe. But anyway... And if, if, you know, they, there's all that lore in, like, the, uh, general data? Those, <laughs> no. Oh. There's all that lore in the books about, uh, in those, in those, uh, books we keep referencing, because every time Kirk is brought up, we bring him up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. about, like, preserver DNA and all that stuff. Like, what if they need <laughs> The returned books, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What if they needed <laughs> Kirk back for something like that? Like, he's, 
you know, they need they need Kurt back like they needed the whales back, you know? Uh-huh. <laughs> It's like the aliens show up and they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. like they're called in Kirk, aren't they? Some big Kirk shaped probe comes up. Like, <laughs> it just sounds like, it's like it's like the whales, but with pauses. This is what I'm trying to do. Uh, Spock. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And part of that Inglorious Trexperts cast, they were, uh, they covered each of the individual films from the Star Trek franchise. And they were talking about Star Trek Generations and the death of Kirk. And Metallus said, Look, it's not how I would have sent Kirk off, clearly, because I just put his body in Daystrom. <laughs> 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 and he says, uh, Kirk is dead. We figured, is his body really just under a pile of rocks on a planet? We're not committed. We're not saying he's resurrected. It is a tip of the hat to The Return, which is a wonderful book I recommend to all of you. <laughs> oh my gosh. He says, That's maybe. amazing. That's amazing. We just leave it open that someday some brilliant writer could do something. That could be an animated thing. That could be anything. Please make the return, Canon. Please just make the return. That's what I need. I need them to just make the return. Have them regenerate Kirk's body into, like, a younger form, new actor, Chris Pine, whatever. Bring him yeah. on as a Borg and have them do the return. Oh, God. <laughs> and Jack Crusher can fill the, like, uh, Picard role. Yeah. He says, that could be anything. It's just to keep, as my friend Spock is fond of saying, there are always possibilities. That was the idea behind it. Um, so I thought you'd enjoy that. That's amazing. And you just, you organically brought up the book series. Yeah. Right, as I was going well, into that. Well, of course. So that's of course awesome. That. It, leaving Kirk's body available, it's like the, the return is, is right there, man. Yeah. <sighs> so a fan on Twitter said, I'm about at the point where if Cisco doesn't reemerge from the wormhole in the finale to the trumpeting theme of DS9 to take on the Changelings once more, there may be riots. And Terry, <laughs> Terry Metallus responded, get your riot gear, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that's not happening. It's just, just from no. like a storytelling perspective, I love the idea of bringing uh, Cisco back. That could be like the thing at the end the post credits thing or like thing thing that brings the back back into the action or something but like mm -hmm. i don't see that being like the way you re you don't resolve a story that way you have to have the characters make decisions that resolve the story yeah ben cisco is my favorite starfleet captain and indeed one of my favorite top five star trek characters but if it doesn't fit organically into the story if avery brooks doesn't want to come back if there are all the any of these issues i just i'm okay you don't have to put it back. I'm not going to be mad at the showrunner and start talking about riots and shit. Yeah. Like, <laughs> do you think? Do you think they'll ever recast Cisco? Um, I don't know that DS9 is popular enough to even warrant it. That's what I'm saying. That's what exactly what I was thinking. Although, you know, just like we're talking about this stuff, where you could bring easily bring back Kirk in all kinds of ways with a, with a Project Phoenix, you could bring his mm -hmm. body back in any form. Uh, him coming back from the wormhole, you could bring. You know, they've 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 created all kinds of whatever pe like effects on the world. You could totally see uh, a, a a thing where like Cisco came back different. I don't really, I, I don't know if I would want that. But if they if they had a good story idea for like why the prophets are finally sending him back and Avery doesn't want to do it anymore, yeah, I, I feel like there's a way to make that happen. Um, mm hmm. W way to make a new actor make sense when he's been floating around with the prophets for 30 years. Yeah. I mean, there's a way you could just say it. You can just say like, you know, Oh, I've rejuvenated my body. Ha! Huh! You know, huh. <laughs> 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 why does, why, <laughs> why did, I tried to make that laugh. <laughs> Oh, it's Cisco, <laughs> a wonderful Cisco laugh. And instead I came out sounding like one of the, uh, Aliens from Galaxy Quest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just think of like Cisco on the beach in the first episode in the emissary and where he sees Jennifer and he's like, ho ho! That's like what I always think of when I think of him. 
But um, it's like the worst <laughs> laugh ever. Like it's, it gives me like cringe goosebumps. I'm like, oh, why? I love it. I love it so much. Um, someone on Twitter, uh, PDP does Trek says, by the way, since Terry Metalis announced the title of the last episode of Star Trek Picard as the last generation, I think people have been scared. My take is that last likely means most recent rather than final or ultimate in this case. And Terry Metalis says, nope, it means final. <laughs> 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 remain scared <laughs> <laughs> remain petrified <laughs> um and uh so and uh, in, in much the same way someone was complaining that uh janeway has to show up and terry metallis says before anyone gets their hopes up janeway is exclusively on star trek prodigy but there are other voyagers out there in the alpha quadrant mm. so janeway hopes dashed yeah. Dry your eyes, mate. <laughs> well, uh, the, the good thing about that is we're not going to get any weird time things where every time the Janeway in Prodigy is in trouble, we know she survives because she showed up here. Of course, I guess we know she survived because they've been talking about her and how she's still working and stuff. But uh-huh. I don't know how Prodigy stacks up timeline-wise to here. I don't know how much earlier it is. or if It's, a, it's earlier than this, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember. Mm. Okay. I just, I legitimately just don't. If I did know, I don't remember. I'm really bad about this. If I was 13 again, I would have all of this mapped out on like a chart in front of my computer. Yeah, you definitely have the poster with all the timelines. And <sighs> apparently it's 2021 in Prodigy. Oh. oh, sorry, that's when it came out. Uh- <laughs> okay, so Prodigy is the year 2383. 2383. 2383? What? So it's 24th century still. I guess so, yeah. It's five and, years after the end of Voyager. Oh, it's oh, so it's like 25 years before this. I guess so. Wow. Or no, maybe just 10, 10 15 years? I don't know. I don't know exactly, but it's definitely before this. Yeah, I don't know when Picard is. <laughs> I just don't know that. <laughs> The first distant year, 2399. 2399, yeah, is... Okay, so mm-hmm. 2399, so it's just now the 25th century. We, I, we, they kept talking about 25th century, and I'm guessing, I guess it just became the 25th century after yeah. the first season. Okay. What was the other one? Uh, what, what did you just say Prodigy was? Hell, I don't know, man. <laughs> I just, just told you. I know, what I was trying to compare. I don't remember. <laughs> 2383. Okay, so it's like 17 years-ish, 17, 18 years before this. Hmm. Okay, that's, that's some distance. Yeah. I'm good with that. So many, so many, so many different places in time that Star Trek is happening now. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, we were talking earlier about three different time periods, but, like, really. I mean, and Lower Decks is another one that I don't know where it fits, but it's like, it's, it's, he's still on the Titan, so it's probably closer to Prodigy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. And, moving on. What else we got? And it's always 2268 in my heart. <laughs> hey, man. It's 2399 somewhere, baby. Yeah. <laughs> We've got feedback. <laughs> what I like what I like about Star Trek is I get older, but they stay the same age. No. <laughs> Please no. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Timothy, Timothy Castillo. Uh, sends us an email still too much mystery left in the remaining episodes you might know this by now as there's a lot of articles floating around with this explanation but the defiant with the cloaking device was destroyed in the dominion war this was the sao paulo renamed by cisco to be the defiant yeah i did wonder about that actually if if they had the cloaking device on the new defiant Mm. if you remember the, that episode um, yeah i remember there was a there was a destruction of one i just assumed they eventually reinstalled it or something, but I guess not. Yeah. What did you guys think of the literal moral question between Picard and Beverly? Beverly straight up said that she's lost her moral compass, and then they both were just ready to kill Vatic. I hated it. Not even an I put them down, they stay down line of reasoning. No lawyer Picard, just, yeah, kill her. Yeah, An interesting turn for our heroes. (laughs) Not interesting to me. Not interesting at all. It's like, 
I, I just, I, yeah, we didn't even talk about it which, because I just was like, it just didn't feel like Star Trek to me. And I understand they're like saying how dark of a place they're in or whatever, but like, I don't know, man. I just don't feel like Picard has. Picard was still like trying to reason with the Borg last season. You know what I mean? Like he's mm-hmm. he hasn't gone through that much since then. He has a son now, but if just having a son makes you uh, that much of a worse person, <laughs> it does. Haven't you met people who have kids? They're terrible. That's true. Sorry, They're like sorry. I would kill anybody for my kid. <laughs> Oh man, have you seen The Last of Us? Or no. have you seen what it's about? I know of it in existence. I won't I won't spoil the plot, but one of the major like themes of the story is um once you love someone, how far will you go mm-hmm. for them? And uh, it asks that question to great effect. Um, yeah, it's really well done. Well, I'm okay. I'm okay with uh I think they're ha- they've had it with Vatic. And Vatic's bullshit. I think sure. there's just no way around it. You know, well, they tried honestly, to reason with Vatic earlier on. It wouldn't have. It's just like it wouldn't have bothered me if they just didn't have that conversation. Like they didn't need to have that conversation. They, like she gets out like three seconds later. I don't know. It it was it was weird to me because it was like the writers wanted us to know that they're in a dark place. But like I don't I don't mm-hmm. know that that dark place was earned. I mean. I could see it from Beverly because we haven't seen her in thirty years, or whatever. But we've been still been watching Picard the last two seasons, and he was not drifting that far morally. You know, he's still been the moral center of the show. I don't need two seasons. They they were just like a uh, like attacked and thrown down into like the into a gravity well inside of some big celestial being. This creature is obviously working for the changelings and they want to freaking overtake and have indeed invaded the Federation. Uh, this is, this is war. This is life and death. Like, yeah, but that's straight that's up the whole point though. They're talking about murdering a prisoner. It's not, it's not whether they should murder her. It's whether they should murder her in cold blood when they're her, she's their prisoner. And she has gleefully been after Jack this entire time. Yeah, I don't know. Like cackling and saying weird shit. Like sure, <laughs> sure. But that's the other thing is like from a practical perspective. Not even talking about the morality of it, which I also disagree with. But from a practical perspective, she has more information. Like yeah, they still don't know. Like they 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 said that thing to her. Like they assumed they were like, oh, we've already figured out your plan. And then she just smirked at them, but mm-hmm. she didn't confirm it. Like, they right. don't know if they're right. <laughs> and it's annoying to me that they just, like, were ready to kill her without, like, confirmation of her plan, finding out more. Of, like, from a practical perspective, it didn't even make It didn't make any sense. It just, it felt like the writers wanted to write a moral quandary, and then they did not explore it well, in my opinion. Okay. It didn't bother me at all. Like, I, people are complex. They are layered with different emotions. They let their emotions emotions guide them. And I think uh, I think that was some of what was going on here, and they're also you know they've got a lot of hubris. They've been doing this a long time. They they're like, oh yeah, we figured sure. out your stupid plan. So like I don't I don't know. I, there was they've been through it this season in general. So I guess. I'm just sort of like you know what like yeah they're gonna try to like keep their kids safe and whatnot. Uh, I, I've watched enough Star Trek that I'm. I don't know, dude. I'm just not one of these who's like, they didn't sit and talk for two hours about this quandary. Like, they know they didn't. Because sometimes, depending on the episode, they don't always do that. They're all inconsistent. That's not what I said. Yeah. They don't have to, like, sit and have a conversation about it. They just have to be, like, somewhat consistent characters. And I feel like in this moment, I don't know. They like or ha- give if they're gonna if they're gonna insert a moral quandary in the left show, let it be more complex. Let them both have different come to different decisions. You know, mm-hmm. let him see that Crusher is ready to kill on sight to protect her son, and let that make him question: Is he too? And then have mm-hmm. that ability snatched away from him before he can. So like so that he still so that you as the audience is like: Is Picard that dark? You know, there's a lot of ways to play it, but it just felt like. They brought up a moral quandary and immediately answered it in a way that was like to me not compelling <clears throat> or thoughtful. Uh, it was just kind of to me. It was like, yeah, let's you know. It's it's like that. It's like they wanted to show us how dark they've gotten so that they can loop us back around to hopeful before the end of the season. 
mm-hmm. and so they can end on a big hopeful thing, but it it didn't earn it in my opinion. But I don't know. It felt earned to me, but cool. This whole season's been just like them running the TNG characters through the shit storm, so. <laughs> yeah, see, I just don't see it that way. Like, I mean, sure, the only difference between every other thing they've ever gone through is that, like, he has a son. And that just, like... Yeah. I've already seen The Last of Us. Um, <laughs> I'm not particularly, like... I don't like the idea that, like... I don't know. Somehow having a child... Allows you to completely throw your morals out the window. Again, like, yeah. I, I know too many people with children. I've seen it. <laughs> I have too. I have too. And I understand what you're saying. It's just like, it's annoying because it's Picard who should be questioning those baser urges. Like, that's who Picard is. He's like, oh, yes, I'm I'm the Picard that wants to kill all the Borg, but I realize my hatred is 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 misplaced and and now these borg are being saved or whatever he's gone through all these things what if in first contact lily wasn't there to like call him on his shit what if someone was there who agreed with him right well that's the point though first contact is him being pushed to his absolute limit and that's the the species that took over his body and used him to kill thousands and like that's the most emo- one of the most emotional moments of his life, and he is brought to the brink of real darkness, and it is earned there. And they had to put someone in his way to go, no, 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 you can't be that guy. And like that's earned, and I love that scene. I love that, uh, you know, you broke your little ship scene. Uh, and like this one does not. F- I, d- I don't feel like anything he's gone through this season approaches at all his Borg experience. I don't know. I'm very curious because I, I don't have children. I can't like speak to it necessarily. I can only speak to like what I've heard, you know, people with kids say is that, you sure. know, you will love them and care about them more than you ever loved or cared about yourself. So in that right. way, it makes sense for Picard to be on this level right here with the batting. But uh, do uh, I want you parents out there to write us for the next episode and say, like, what do you think? Do you think Picard was justified in his feelings? You know, because I don't know. I don't have a kid. Sure, sure. Um, I just like no matter what a parent says, I don't think it's justified. <laughs> I think a parent's wrong too. They can say that's the emotion that you have as a parent, but like I'm not saying it's justified. I'm saying it's it, you know these characters cannot be necessarily 100 percent perfect like sure. like complaining that that's not the picard i know i mean well, fuck the picard you know the people change sure things change sure situations that, change change has to be earned on screen to me and i don't think this one was and i do let's move on <laughs> yeah <laughs> timothy castillo continues uh I liked the Jordy data slash lore interaction, but because these modern series have given villains a bit more teeth, the possibilities of lore in this series are honestly terrifying. I really thought he was going to harm, if not kill Jordy at certain points, and I'm still hoping it doesn't happen because that would be devastating. Oof. Don't know if I could handle that one. I don't think I don't think it will. Yeah, that would be that'd be pretty terrible to see um yeah, I can't even, I can barely talk about it. Like, to see, like, those two, mm-hmm. that their relationship is what brought me into Star Trek. You know, like, they are the thing that, like, I find, that, like, was the first thing that, like, caught my eye or whatever uh, when I was watching Star Trek with my parents as, like, a three-year-old or whatever, five-year-old probably. Um, and, like, I have great affection for those characters. And the idea of Jordy being murdered by a bot that his best friend is living in um, mm-hmm. and see, and his best friend is experiencing it through his own eyes. Like, yeah, no, you can't do that. I, I would not be okay with that. Yeah. I might rage quit. Like, that, that's and, terrible. And the, the way that you just described it makes me kind of hope they do it. <laughs> nope. Not me. <laughs> um. Timothy says, hey, Dave, I like LOL. That's a great episode. Let's talk about some Nacelle light placement for 10 minutes or so. Did I say I don't like LOL? Or that episode? I don't know. I think I think uh. he's picking on you for 
S- skipping, I don't know, I don't know what it, <laughs> maybe like, yeah, I don't know, skipping over lol and then talking about nacelle placement for a while <laughs> instead of like talking about the characters. Uh, I don't know, maybe. I, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't, don't remember, remember what we. I said. don't remember you doing that last week, but it may it's possible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's possible. We like <laughs> we were starting to talk about lol and then like, yeah, but this was different, and then we start talking about whatever nacelles or whatever. yeah, maybe it's possible. <laughs> Um, <laughs> sorry, Timothy. <laughs> I don't know what I did to upset you. <laughs> I wish we had memories, man. It'd be really good. <laughs> yeah, you know, but you know, ADHD. It's hey, true. so Timothy says I like the Laforges. I like that Vatic is pretty scary up against our protagonist, but cowers at whoever the bloody meat hand is. Meathead is uh, in a uh, diff- different series. I would assume that character would be the series Big Bad, and Vatic is a tragic, fluidic villain caught between a blender and a wave pool. I like seeing the TNG <laughs> cast. There's a lot to like and love. The writing has been great overall. They need to pull back the curtain. They can't keep leaving mystery up in the air for the remaining episodes. The first time Jack brought up whatever is going on with him felt right. A misdirect or not the whole story, that's right. Or sorry, that's fine. But the second time he brought up here with Picard, Picard just says they might have some advantage. And then we have a broken episode jump to half baked plan to trap Vatic instead of exploring what's up with Jack. There was no obvious reason shutting the ship down and waiting for Vatic was a good idea. It seems like it would have been a better idea to go the Romulans for help at that point. Cue my Laris and Sela idea. Just saying. <laughs> we'll see where this all goes, I guess, but this episode felt a bit lost, even while having some really good stuff in it. Back to more happy endings. Speaking of Jordy's family from All Good Things, if his kids are the same, does that mean he did end up with Leah Brahms after all? He definitely enjoyed working on her engine in the holodeck. <laughs> vroom, vroom. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. <laughs> I mean, maybe he's still with Leah Brahms. Yeah, seems like maybe. Seems like it's very possible. Um... Yeah, I mean, I wasn't a huge fan of the last episode. It was fine. I wasn't upset by it. I think uh, huh? I think Timothy's hits here are fair. I think that, we, we're, yeah, I, I, I said the same thing. It was really strange. It almost felt like it was edited strangely or something. Like, the idea to shut the ship down and, and like, present uh, Jack as bait felt very rushed. Like, it, it felt mm-hmm. like the kind of plan that, like, that's a big swing of a plan to to let the guy you've been running and hiding to let the bad guy catch up with you that you know is way overpowered and everything like you don't know what their intentions are and all that like maybe they just show up and blow you up because their plans are different now or what you know like you just don't know and uh so i don't know it was weird it was it was a weird yeah. weird episode i think some of the logic is a little skewed maybe all right well, who's up next uh, John plays what says theory. The real Beverly Crusher is dead. Ooh. He says, this is kind of long. So I know you may not want to read on air, but I'd love to hear your opinions. Okay. So after y'all read my fir- my last email, I sound batshit crazy. However, <laughs> <laughs> I'm becoming more and more sold in your species. Eight, four, seven, two theory. So what if eight, four, seven, two are controlling the Vadix changeling sect? They are actually behind the Starfleet takeover and retribution for Janeway assisting the Borg with sending them back to fluidic space back in the Delta Quadrant. They are forcing the Changelings to do their dirty work so that they can remain hidden for now. Go Google an image of the face that was talking to Vatic and an image of Species 8472 face and tell me they don't look uncannily alike. I agree. Yeah. I've been saying this all along. Totally agree. Then this week we saw Tuvok, quote unquote, able to pull the wool over Seven's eyes, albeit briefly, by referencing their Kalto games back on Voyager. Obviously, 8472 could read Tuvok's mind and know specifics about how to trick any of his friends. However, I, I, I took that a little differently when she asked him about Kalto and then uh-huh. pretends to be uh, convinced so that he will let his guard down and let something slip. I think like. She gave him an easy, easy one so that he would stop like trying as hard or something. You know what I mean? Right. I think that's what was going on there. Yeah. Um, let's see. However, when Seven asked him something not related to their friendship, like the planet she referenced meeting at, they didn't know how to react, and that thus blowing their cover. Well, if if the eight four seven two though could read the mind and know to talk about Kalto, then wouldn't they be able to do the same thing with where they met? 
Right. Which is why I like yeah. I like my theory that like they were no longer on guard. Like maybe they'd yeah. been like literally actively l- reading his thoughts at that moment and then went, "Okay, she believes me now. She's not testing him anymore." And then like mm-hmm. continued to have a conversation. Cuz sounds yeah, smart yeah. like that. She is. John continues, so let's think back to when Crusher reached out to Picard. Perhaps Beverly knew they would set a trap for Picard, so she intentionally misinformed them to give Hellbird as a clue to Picard. He wouldn't know Hellbird because he was Locutus when the Hellbird program crippled the Enterprise. So when Crusher told Picard to trust no one, he would have to bring other people in because he doesn't know what the hell Hellbird is. This would mean... That Beverly Crusher we know and love is either captured slash imprisoned or already dead. Sad face. Which would mean that Beverly... <laughs> he literally wrote sad face, by the way. It wasn't an emoji. <laughs> Which would mean the Beverly we've seen this season is a changeling put in place as a trap for Picard. Why? To install his son, quote-unquote, into the Federation. But little does he know, he doesn't actually have a son. Instead, the Jack Crusher we know is actually... An 8472 shape-shifting sleeper agent that was raised to believe he was Picard's son. I would believe all of this theory. Yeah. Perhaps their intent is to install Jack 8472 into the Federation with the Picard family legacy to climb the ranks by controlling his superiors telepathically. The only problem is that Jack is not, quote, waking from his sleeper status like he should, thus 8472 are trying to get him back and fix him. When Vadek talks to him on the Titan, she is almost requesting him to come with them, almost treating him with reverence like she's afraid of what happens to her if she or her crew trust, uh, hurts him. The first step in realizing you have a problem, and I realize I spend way too much time theorizing different potential storylines. Sorry, this was long. Uh, thoughts? Uh... I think they would have to have tricked eight four an eight four seven two to believe that it was Beverly. I don't think this is an eight four seven two pretending to be Beverly. I think if it is an eight four seven two being as Beverly, she doesn't know she's not Beverly. Mm. It's possible. It would be quite the dramatic moment if we find out that Beverly is either is either a changeling or an eight four seven two. Either way, um, that would be or like honestly, if any of our like core crew that we've been like hanging out with all this time we find out has been a changeling all along this season would be a pretty great twist it would it would diminish the season a little bit because it'd be like oh this is our last big hurrah with our our people and then but i guess they could have one last episode where they they get the real crusher out of a vat somewhere yeah (laughs) i you know i don't i just don't know i i feel like beverly continuing to say trust no one is us telling us telling or them telling me, don't trust Beverly. Mm. I just, I feel I feel like the one thing this is leaving out is the uromotic syndrome, and the fact that they went for Picard's body first. Hmm. It seems like they went for Picard's body. Something about Picard's body was not what they needed, or something. And then yeah. they went for Jack. And the one connection there is the Erdemotic Syndrome. I'm like, I don't know what the plot is there, but that's the one thing that I feel like this this yeah. theory leaves out. There is that. There is that. That's a yep. good point. That's a good point, Matt. Damn it. <laughs> Foiled again. It could still be somehow a lot of those things, but I, I, I do think that's going to tie in somehow. Yeah, maybe so. Matthew Davis writes to us, says, Somehow I get the feeling we're going to see someone from the TNG crew die. I just want to put this out there to see how close to correct my guesses are. There are no spoilers here, just predictions based on feelings I get from what's been said on the show and reported in media. The core group from TNG, Picard. This is the final season, after all. What's more fitting? Uh, what's a more fitting way to end? I'm kind of torn. Part of me thinks he's going to die. Part of me thinks he's going to fake his death and retire somewhere with Laris. Uh, yeah, I don't feel like they actually, he's actually, like, ended things with Laris, necessarily, so. Yeah, I didn't get that either. If he starts, like, shacking up with Bev again, I'm gonna be pissed. Uh, Riker, maybe? I hope not. If they kill Will off, Frakes could still return as Thomas. He's still alive, right? And this better not have been a, this has been Thomas all along fake out. I think Will survives. I think he does too, mainly because Terry Metallus says he would be in Legacy. (laughs) (laughs) Um, 
Deanna. Nah, I think she survives. If she if she dies, there will be cries of her being fridged, being posted online at Warp 9. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, probably. Um, Jordy. I hate to say it, but he's second on my list. I could see him sacrificing himself to save his daughters. If they don't kill off Picard, they may kill off Jordy. I don't think they'll kill off Jordy. Mm. I just don't. Yeah. Especially since know. he's talking about he's down for his legacy. <laughs> but the thing is, a lot of times those kinds of reports or interviews are lies just to generate I know. the possibilities and stuff. So. Matt, I can't exist from week to week thinking Jordy LaForge might be murdered. I just can't. Telling me, brother. You're telling me. Tell me lies. Tell me sweet little lies. Uh, Worf. No. It would be a glorious death, but no. (laughs) (laughs) Beverly, I don't know. On one hand, her death would have a huge impact on Jack. On the other, I'd hate for them to kill her off without a last scene with Wesley. I think she survives. As for the other principal characters, I don't think any of them are likely to die. Rafi might be the most likely. Even then, this has been a great season for her, and I could see her character continuing into any Section 31 plans they have. Uh, Or Legacy, honestly. Mm -hmm. And for the record, I'm writing this before seeing episode seven. Thanks for listening to, or rather reading my ramblings. Mm. Thank you, man. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate you sending in our uh, emails every week now. That's awesome. Love hearing from you. For sure. (laughs) (laughs) What are you laughing at? (laughs) This next message comes from Captain Tattered Foreskin. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) <laughs> is this the final message of the of the evening? No, there's still a stew, I think. This will come as a surprise to you both. But I enjoy Dave's weird, off-putting genital humor. <laughs> I wouldn't have ever guessed that tattered foreskin. <laughs> Please don't stop. <laughs> Go deeper if you will. <laughs> I need you to pound. <laughs> I need you to pound my cervix with your funny bone. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not as good as Dave is with this. I, anyway, I love Star Trek and I love your show. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Captain Tedder Dorskin. Uh, and I am upset at you because mm-hmm. Dave will take this and run with it as his vindication <laughs> of his humor. No, no. If anything, it was a suppressant. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I read that. I read that name, and my dick flinched. <laughs> All right. So give us stews. Give us. We got stew. Let's do it. Stew. Stew says, "Hey guys." At first, I was like, "Oh no, Tuvok is dead." Then I was like, "Oh, not yet." But then I was like, "He should be dead. Fuck him." Hashtag justice for Tuvix. (laughs) Also, justice for cervix from the last email. I don't really agree that exploiting something about a particular race to create something that can be used against them is tantamount to genocide. If that were true, Kirk was committing genocide on Rurapente when he kicked that guy in his knee balls. A concern that the weapon could be misused by others would have been a more reasonable concern, in my opinion. Yeah, I'd agree with that problem. Yeah, yeah, I think some of that, like, it really felt like... That one and the other moral question of this episode both felt like very, like, ham-fisted attempts at is- inserting a moral question into this episode. <laughs> well, see, but I I went with, like, uh, the person saying that it was tantamount to genocide was emotionally compromised on the subject. It's the same as, like, people nowadays being like, you know, I don't know, you like popcorn that someone who's a Republican ate? You're a Nazi! Okay. That's right. a little too far. Yeah. I didn't, you know, even, I didn't know Orville Redenbacher was Republican. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll eat great value. Come on, man. Now on. Come on, man. You saw the bow tie. You knew what you were doing. 
That's a weird. That was just like the best weird thing I could come up with. It was good. I liked it. Um, <laughs> Picard's participation at Frontier Day requires his identity to be confirmed by genetic validation. Do they know he's got a synthetic a synthetic body now? Or is it that his body's supposed to be organically synthetic like the Cylons were in BSG or replicants in Blade Runner? That's a good point. Like, yeah. how are they gonna? How are they gonna do that? Yeah, for sure. Like, it, <clears throat> it's like if they test him, and they're like, "Aren't you not supposed to be biological?" Like, I, I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> and they use they're using his like you know body from the whatever Daystrom. Mm-hmm. Like they just like they go to prick him to check his genetic de- his gen- his blood, you know, and he just starts squirting like the white cum from Alien, you know, that all the robots had. I just I just thought about the idea of two changelings weakened at burning, bur- weakened at burning uh-huh. the dead body of Picard up to the podium. <laughs> Some sort of Trojan horse. Yeah, actually. You say that, but that is a really good call. <laughs> what? That is. What do you mean? Like, okay, <laughs> it's a terrible call. <laughs> For shits and giggles, let's say that when they modified the Golem android body to look like Picard, they also gave him his genetics. Sure, sure. They gave him his, you know, whatever. So he could still read as Picard anywhere. Mm-hmm. So if they could do that, then the changelings might be able to just like go into the dead Picard body and reanimate it by way of like living inside of it and moving around. Like I, you, there might I'm be. In a, a, I'm in a Picard suit. <laughs> he's basically Edgar yeah, from the Men in Black. Edgar like, from Men in Black. Uh, <sighs> I was looking for water, <laughs> sugar water. Like, oh my I, god! I said it a couple episodes ago, but we're gonna get robots versus zombies, and I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> Uh, Stu continues, Lord doesn't have a perverted sense of what it means to be human, Jordy. He's just a personification of the fact that some people are assholes. Actually, wasn't Lore basically like a sociopath because of Soong's imperfect design? That's kind of ableist. <laughs> <laughs> Vadix boss referring to changelings as your kind implies they are not one themselves. Is Gul Dukat returned to do some Paw Wraith shit? Ooh. I doubt it, but ooh. <laughs> I like where your head's at, Stewie. <laughs> <laughs> Quote, I took an oath to do no harm. So what was with you using a phaser shotgun in the premiere then? <laughs> it's true. She's like turning these assholes to ash. Yeah, she's yeah, like, for real. I will say, now like, she's saying I took- that was self-defense. This is a different thing because it's be murdering someone who's in their care. Mm-hmm. But it is different. But yeah. yeah. Vadic's origin is great. No snark. Oh, wow. Stu minus the snark? Yeah. At first, uh, when I first saw it, I almost said shark. <laughs> I didn't know what that meant. And I was like, oh, wait. Yeah. That N can really look like an H sometimes. Yeah, man. <laughs> Damn it, Lore. You could be on Team Picard as the zany wildcard member. Don't throw it away out of spite. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, Jack isn't Picard's son. He's Professor Xavier's. I kind of thought Sydney was about to die, and that's why she's the daughter not played by LeVar Burton's actual offspring. Anything could happen, but I'm starting to suspect they won't explain why Q was dying last season. Good episode, (laughs) giving some... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Good episode, giving some illumination on a few things. Was that ever, is that even supposed to be on the table anymore? Yeah. I don't want to know why he was dying. It takes the mystery out of the continuum. Oh my See, gosh. do you know what? One of my biggest problems with Voyager is they like sapped too much mystery out of the Borg and the continuum. Yeah, sure. Those are Creed Bratons. You don't want to know. Well, I see. I, I I hear you. But the idea behind a good show like this is you 
you reveal those mysteries, and then the Borg and the Q can become a little more part of the protagonist side, and you introduce new mysteries. You know, in the original series, Mm -hmm. the Romulans and the Klingons were much more like, you know, just antagonists that we knew little about except for whatever, uh, deception and honor, you know? And then as we, like, as they became more, like, more well-rounded characters, you know, we get to know them, then they introduce the Borg and the Q. Yeah. And it'd be okay with me if they'd done that, and while doing that, they introduced new species that were all so mysterious and interesting, but I don't think we really got that from Voyager. Yeah. Ah, well. <laughs> Uh, Stu says, good episode, giving some illumination on a few things, though Jack's superpowers are a bit of a leap for me. No, I'm good with superpowers on Star Trek. Oh, yeah. It's sci-fi. It's all sci-fi bullshit. Yeah. I'm good. Me too. I'm also good with fantasy in Star Trek to some degree. Like, I don't really want to see, like, maybe one episode with a dragon, but I don't want to see all of it. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, we went to one planet where there was a dragon and some incest, but I think Lower Decks already did that, so. (laughs) Yeah, I think they did. All right. Uh, That's it. That's all we've got. Oh, well, thank you, Stu. Good stuff. That You really got me with the... I'm starting to think they're not going to explain why Q died last (laughs) season. Oh, man. That's funny. That's really funny. (laughs) All right. Well, uh, man, I'm excited. Yeah. We got three episodes left. Is that right? Um, something like that. Something like that. Well, I'm eight, nine, and ten. Freaking pumped, man. Uh, well, guys, hope you guys are having fun out there. Hope you're uh cruising and hanging out and watching lots of Star Trek this week. We'll be back. <laughs> Where are they cruising? Where are they cruising? Cruising, man. What? We're all just cruising. <laughs> um, what is? Are you, are you gonna start breaking into like the California theme, the Dreams may, theme song? Maybe I will. Maybe I will. Uh, Surf dudes with attitude. (laughs) Well, we'll be back um, to cruise with you next week here on Star Trek Universe. (laughs) Joel on True. (laughs) I'm not cruising anywhere. Live long and prosper, though. Thank you for listening to the Star Trek Universe Podcast, a Stranded Panda production. If you'd like to hear more from David C. Robertson, check out the DC On Screen Podcast or maladjusted.tv for his web videos. If you'd like to hear more from Matthew Carroll, check out the Marvel Cinematic Universe Podcast or listen to his music. Just search for Matthew Carroll anywhere you get music. 